Well, good morning, and today we are gonna conclude our emphasis on prayer. We began the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting, and so today I wanna share with you one of my favorite foundational verses when it comes to prayer. Uh, it's in Hebrews chapter four, and it's verse 16. But before we get there, let's just acknowledge one thing. Cultivating a discipline of prayer is no easy feat. It is harder than it sounds. I don't know if, about you, but there have been seasons in my life when I, I would just have to acknowledge that I just wasn't praying like I should, and, and I was a missionary, or I was a pastor. And so it takes effort to cultivate the discipline of prayer. John Ortberg writes on prayer, and he lists what he says are some of the most often used excuses for why we're not praying. And as I read through his list, I, I mean, I picked out a few of the excuses that I have used. So here, here's the list. <clears throat> I don't have time to pray. I don't know how to pray. I prayed before and I didn't get away at what I asked for, so I guess prayer doesn't work. I'm not sure uh, there is a God. I think there's a God, but I just don't think he's interested or involved in my little life. My mind wanders when I pray. I, I try a formula prayer, and it feels contrived. If I pray on my own, it feels confusing. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm too cynical. I'm too tired. I fall asleep when I pray. I'm afraid if I pray, God would make me change things I don't want to change. <clears throat> Other people seem to hear from God, but I don't hear from him. If God already knows everything, my prayers won't change anything, so I don't understand why I should bother. I did something bad last night, and so I'm kind of in a spiritual timeout. I can't pray right now. I'm too extroverted. I'm too introverted. It is amazing how we can rationalize why we don't pray. So today we're gonna to talk about cultivating the discipline of prayer. My challenge to you as we conclude the 21 days of prayer and fasting is to keep going. I'm gonna challenge you to pray every single day for the next 30 days to the end of um, February, okay? 28 to 28, it's gonna be another month. But here, here's the deal. What, what if we all decided that we're gonna come what may, whether we feel strong or weak, we're gonna pray every single day. So the first thing that we do is we get up and we pray. Now, I like to kneel. When I kneel, it makes me, it, it helps me, because you know I'm kind of a scatterbrain sometimes. I'm going through the list of things I've gotta do, people I need to call, and, and, and so it helps me. When I kneel, I'm focusing on what I'm doing, and when I kneel, I remember I am kneeling before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm making myself small because I acknowledge that he is big, and so I, I do love to, now not everybody can kneel, I get it, but everyone can get a place and begin the day with prayer. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. It doesn't have to be a fancy prayer. It can be a prayer you read out of scripture like the Lord's Prayer. It can be a prayer like we're gonna look at today in Hebrews chapter four and verse 16. But just the idea is cultivate the discipline of prayer. You know, cultivating the discipline of prayer is really getting to know God. It's getting to walk with God. You know, from the very beginning of the Bible, we read that the purpose of God when he created um, Adam and Eve and all of mankind was God wants to love us and live with us and he wants a relationship with us. Do you hear the goodness in that? When he created Adam and Eve at the very beginning, we read about how that God would come in the cool of the evening and he, he would come, he would actually come. I don't understand all of that, but it, it, and, and he, he would commune with Adam and Eve. And then the day came when they decided that they didn't want 
God the way he wanted them, and they chose to sin, and something broke in their relationship. And the next time God came, they hid from God because they were afraid. And God asks questions. God never asks questions because he needs information. He only asks questions because he wants us to think about stuff. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the fruit? Well, she gave it to me. There you have the first marital strife right there. Is it hard to stay married and be married in a good way? And everybody should answer, yes. It started way back then. But what happened is we said we're out. And all of humanity fell. And the separation began. And what does God do throughout the Bible? It's, 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 a, it's both a wonderful and sad story. God comes to Abraham because the whole whole world doesn't want to be in a relationship with him. He says, well, what if I just pick one man, and I start with one man, and if, and if I could convince this man that I love him, and I will bless him, and, and, and if he would love me back, and he would want me, then I could, I could have a relationship with him. And then what, what if the rest of the world could observe that Abraham and his family in a relationship with me they, they were flourishing, and it's good, and it was better. And, and so that was the plan. God's plan was, I'm going to reach the whole world by showcasing that my desire is to be in a relationship with people. But as you read through the story, Abraham and his children didn't ever get it right. And it went from bad to worse. Finally, God sent his son, and Jesus came and from a cross, he declares, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God says, I want you. I want to be in a relationship with you. As abstract as that sounds, that, he, that we in flesh as human beings could be in a relationship with God. We see evidence that it's possible in Scripture. You know, one of the reasons why we don't pray is because we don't really want God to be that in charge of us. Um, you know, it was my daughter's, my daughter Coco's birthday this month, and she's the fourth born out of five children. And because it was her birthday, Cindy decided to show <clears throat> some of the family home videos, okay, which you all would be bored with. But we sat there and we watched baby Coco being held by older sister Tiffany and, and older sister Holly. And then the, the, we put Coco in her little brother's hands he, he's eight, 17 months older than Coco, and he like touched her, and then he was done. And as we watched this video, I remember the chaos of my home, where they're all trying to get in front of the video, and they're pushing each other away, and they're jumping off the bed, and they're grabbing this and grabbing that, and, and I'm, I'm like, wow, I, I actually do remember those days. I mean, my house was absolutely chaotic. Things were out of control. Things were a mess. Do you ever have times like that? One of my favorite speeches that Cindy ever gave I heard her one day, frustrated by all of these kids going their own separate ways, fighting each other, taking this, taking that, and, and, and she, she was just done. She says, you kids, you sit down. You have no idea all of the good things I have planned to do with you so that you could have fun, but no, I can't get to those things because I'm so busy correcting all of your misbehavior." You know, I really think that that's how God is looking down at us. And he says, you, know, you, you, you act like I'm the problem. I'm not the problem. You have no idea how much I love you 
and how much I want to bless you and how much I want to help you. And God calls us into a relationship. And that's where we learn the goodness of God. Ephesians chapter 2 is, is such a beautiful passage. It starts out by saying, and he made alive who he made and 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 you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because he wants a relationship, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Verse seven, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. Through faith. Wow. This is the God of heaven who says, oh, please, no one loves you like I do. No one is committed to your well-being like I am. No one has the path of, of human flourishing like I have for you. Will you listen to me? Will you come to me? Romans chapter eight, another one of my favorite passages where it says this, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Did you hear that? If we have a relationship with God, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now what are the credentials of God that prove that he is for us? Here they are. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor things nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because God wants to be in a relationship with us. Some of you are here today, and you are in deep pain, and you have great disappointments, and it's so hard and your temptation will be to turn away from God, but the only answer really that's gonna help you is this, turn to God. And believe this, that what's gonna separate you from the love of God? Okay, so what is the most important thing in your life? It's the love of God, to walk in the presence of God, to seek him daily, and to just trust him. In the middle of the struggle, confusion, and the sadness and loss. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You know, for, for 30 days, try 30 days. Get on your knees. And I, like I say, I know some of you can't get on your knees, so just accept that as a metaphor. Whatever you want to do, sit in your chair. That's good. Me, I want to get on my knees. For 30 days, get on your knees. First thing you do in the morning, go find your spot. Get on your knees. And pray to God and say, God, thanks for the way you like me. I've told you this before, but I'll never forget the day that I 
had James when he was just a little guy sitting on my lap, and he says, Dad, you like me? I said, James, I love you. He says, no. He grabs my face, turns it straight to his face. We're eye to eye at this point, and he's pulling me close, and he says, Dad, do you like me? I like you, James. If all you do is get up in the morning and get on your knees and say, God, thank you that you made me and you like me and you want to be good to me and I want to learn how to walk with you through the good times and the bad times because I can't do life by myself and I need you with me. You know, when we, um, when, when we neglect to pray, what we say is, God, I got this. I don't need to bother you with this. But then we get overwhelmed because, man, life is just so hard. And if we don't pray, we don't step into this relationship and get the help that we're going to need. By praying, we invite God into that moment, into our lives on that day. We remember intentionally the goodness of God that is directed toward us. We remember the greatness and the power of Almighty God. We remember that he holds tomorrow in his hand. We, 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 believe, we remember his promises. And, and we don't have to be afraid. And we remember even in sickness and weakness and death itself, they don't get the last word because the love of Christ secures us. He is our resurrected Savior who himself died in our place in order to give us the free gift of salvation and eternal life. You say, well, I already know that. But you need to say it every day. You need to say it every day. Because when you talk to someone every day, that's when you develop a relationship. You know, sometimes, you know, what we want, some of, some of us men are wanting to get married and so we're trying to court the wife or court the girlfriend or whatever term you want to use, date, whatever. Um, and it's every day, every day, every day. And then we get married and then we go our separate ways and get busy and we wonder why we don't feel so close as we used to. because we're not pursuing each other anymore. Don't get bored in your relationship with God. Rehearse the goodness of God on your knees every day. God made me to love me. God is for me, not against me. God wants to help me. God's will is always the best path for my life. I mean, prayer is talking to the God who created all things. The safest place you could ever be, regardless of whatever you've done, is on your knees bowing before this God who is the ruler of the universe and he is good and he is loving We've got to get past this idea that, you know, I'm trying to get God to do what I want him to do to make my life better. Because with that attitude, we actually aren't letting God be God. We're telling God what to do for us because we've got the plan. And he just needs to get on board with us. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you ever pray like, like, like that? I have. In those kind of prayers, we actually try to make God our servant when we just need him to be God of all. We need to put our salesmanship away and bow and surrender before this God. We are his servants. This is the best life we could have. 
if God knows all things, if God is good and kind and generous, and he is, part of faith is trusting God. If we knew what God knows and loved like God loves, and if we saw what God sees now and down the road, we would want God to do what he feels is best and good, and we would surrender and say, God, I surrender. <clears throat> Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, I got just like four talking points, but this is how this passage goes. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. First point is this. Help in our time of need. You know what, we are so inclined to live like this. Um, when it's really a bad crisis, we're like, yeah, I need God's help. Oh, God, rescue me. But there's a lot of times in our life where we really have this attitude, eh, I got this, God, I don't need to bother you. I don't need you to, nah, you don't even speak into this. My plan's good, things are good. So we have this idea that there are times of great need and other times where, I don't bother God. But if you think about how life goes, you know, someone makes a wrong comment about you or uses their body language to communicate something that feels kind of like they're criticizing you or making you feel like you're less than or unworthy and your typical response is to bristle. Do you know how to bristle? Well, what do they think? They, who do they think they are? They think they're all that. They, they're, they're saying that about me. Well, I, I've got a few things to say about them. Do you get how this goes? Am I the only one who does this? We so easily can, even in those moments that we can't anticipate, we can become angry and resentful. And, and we, we decide, I'm just not ever going to talk to them anymore. We put them out of our lives. But maybe then what would God's will look like in those situations? Actually, God commands us to be gracious to people who make us bristle. He tells us to forgive them, to love them. All things I can't do without the help of God. So maybe I need God's help more than I realize. You know, when you have a child and they're doing things that make you worry and, you know, you're, man, God, change them. Please stop them. You need God's help, don't you? Maybe a child gets sick and you ask God to heal them. And God says, well, I'm, I'm going to heal you too because your child greatly affects you. You're forever tied to your children. Their journey is your journey. I've told you this before, but when I had a child born who was very sick, I begged God to please intervene and heal him. And he did heal him, but he left the disability. And that confused me. And I said, God, I don't know how to do this. I need your help every day. My son Robert says one day, and I, I love this, he says, you know, Dad, when we got James, for those of you who don't know, James is my fifth-born child. He has Down syndrome. And it, it devastated me, honestly, because I didn't know how to do this. And my son Robert says, you know, Dad, when, when we got James, he made us all slower 
because we had to be slow to catch up with him. And I named him James out of the book of James. And it says in the book of James, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And I even said, God, I'll change his name. Let's go to another book of the Bible. But God gave James to us. And he slowed us down. The other morning I was in the kitchen making my breakfast and James joined me in the kitchen because he's all about making his breakfast. And he's puttering around around me and I said, James, I'm just so glad you're here. He, I'm having this emotional moment. James looks up at me like I'm silly and he says, Dad, I'll whip here. <laughs> I, I know you'll whip here, but I'm just glad you're here. He could not understand what in the world I was talking about. I prayed for God to heal James. It turns out he was healing me. He changed me. Um, those are times I need God. Do you ever feel envious or resentful? Those are times that we need God. When I'm disobedient, that's when I need God. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna live in the sadness of my guilt and feel like I'm worthless or am I gonna ask for forgiveness? I need God in those times. When I'm ungrateful or afraid or tempted, those are times that I need God. When I have lost my joy and peace, I need God in those times. When I realize I don't love God like I should or I've missed opportunities, to bless the people around me, and I regret that. I need God. When, when I need to forgive someone and love them and bless them beyond my ability, I'm reminded once again, I need God. Turns out, I think I need God all the time. I need him every day, all the time. I need him in the good times and the bad times, and the best thing I can do is to go to him with my needs. Not just the big ones the ordinary ones. So we need to go to him in our, with our need. You got a need today? What's the name of your need? Hey, somebody, somebody wants to help you. If you'll get on your knees and you'll go to him in your time of need, you will be in the presence of the person who loves you most paid for you the most, never gives up on you, and will never leave you or forsake you. It is the safest moment of your day. He can do the impossible. Second, we should come boldly before the throne of grace. Come boldly. It is not a throne of judgment. It, you know, it could have been a throne of judgment, but in this passage it says, come boldly be before the throne of grace so that you can receive mercy and the help that you need. Now if I'm coming before a throne, the person who sits on a throne is a king, right? You get that? I, I'm not coming to somebody in a recliner that might be where you sit. I'm coming before the throne. And immediately I am reminded who I'm speaking to. This is the God who with his spoken word created the heavens and the earth. He has great, vast powers beyond our understanding. When you think even about the stars uh, and how much power they have, we see a star every day. It's called the sun. Actually, we haven't seen that sun for a while, but we may this week, okay? And when I, when, you know the sun is extremely powerful. Um, the planets are constantly moving 
It is this divinely orchestrated dance of the planets. You know the earth rotates. Right now as you're sitting still, we're rotating at a thousand miles an hour. You can't even feel it, can you? Anybody here have a car that you drive 200 miles an hour down the road? I don't think so. Please don't. But we are rotating 1,000 miles an hour every second we, this is the dance that God creates. This is the power that he uses to sustain the planets. And, and, and then the earth is rotating around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. There are between 800 billion and 3.2 trillion planets, because who can count, right? There's a bunch, and they are constantly moving. And when I go to prayer, I come boldly before this throne of grace. And the one who sits on that throne is more powerful than I can ever really understand. This is the God who throughout scripture told us stories about how he helped David kill Goliath the giant he gave strength for 90-year-old Sarah to have a baby against all odds in fulfillment of the promise. This is the God who put Daniel in a lion's den but shut the mouths of the lions and he, he sustained him. This is the God who calms the storm, splits the Red Sea, delivers a whole nation out of slavery. I mean, th and this God, this God says, hey, Will you come to me today? Like I made you, I know you, I have a good plan for you, I'm gonna help you. I have all the power you need, for with God nothing shall be impossible. First Corinthians 2, 9 says it's written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him, but bow before the throne and remember his power. Second, th this is a throne of grace and mercy. This is not the throne of, well, I wish you were doing better. It's not, a, it's not, who wants to pray if you bow before the throne of, well, you're just not quite good enough yet, are you? I mean, is that how you think of God? This isn't the God who says, well, listen, I'm only interested in the elites. I want, I want the biblically famous in my court, not just you riffraff. I mean, I'll take Daniel, I'll take David, I'll take Abraham, I'll take John the Baptist, but you, who are you? You know, this is the way the world works, right? And God says, no, 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 no. This is not a throne of condemnation or criticism. This is the throne of, of grace. It is a place of mercy. Yeah, but I just don't deserve to be in God's presence. No, you don't. But it's the throne of mercy, so you're okay. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. Philip Yancey, in his book, writes about Dr. Paul Brand, who devoted his, his life to treating leprosy patients in India. And in the course of an examination one day, he laid his hand on a patient's shoulder and informed him through the translator of the treatment that lay ahead. And to Dr. Brand's surprise, the man, the man began to shake with muffled sobs. Brand turned to the translator, have I said something wrong? She questioned the patient and then replied, no, doctor, he says he is crying because you put your hand around his shoulder until you came here. No one had touched him for years. God says, come. This is a throne of mercy. This is a place for sinners and misfits and the needy and the desperate and the unclean and the losers and the failures and the I don't know what I'm doing. 
but you got to come. It says, lastly, come boldly. Come boldly. Come in confidence. Not confidence in yourself, but confidence in the great love of an eternal God who knows you and created you and wants you more than you could ever imagine, even to the point of sending his son Jesus to a cross. You know, we do need to confess our sins before God, but um, sometimes we're so focused on how bad we are and what we need to confess that we don't really want to pray very often because, wow, I'm like, I'm depressed now. I'm going to be even more depressed after praying. And, and, and um, John Ortberg, uh, one of my favorite writers, he said this. He was reviewing his prayer journals, and he noticed that he had written about his failures his inadequacies and his weaknesses. And he said he could sense God saying to him, John, I'm the master of the universe, the creator of all that is, and your prayers are depressing me. I'm God and I don't like to be depressed. I'm not used to that. I thought my prayers uh, were, were depressing me. I realized that I'm focusing on the wrong things. I need to focus on the sufficiency of God and the forgiveness of God and not my own failures. You know, God does not invite you to a throne of scolding. Sometimes I think that. I'm just a point of self-correction here. No, no, it's a throne of grace. Have you ever been scolded by somebody? And it's like they like are pounding you into the ground and when they're just about done, they, they have a few more things to say. And unfortunately, as a father, sometimes I even have done stuff like that. But our Father invites us to his throne of grace. Remember, God likes you. He loves you. He's got a plan for you. He wants to walk with you every single day. He created you so that he could love you and you could love him. And one day, in eternity, we will all be there and he will be our God and we will be his people. And he's gonna wipe away every tear from our eyes There'll be no more sickness, no more pain, no sorrow, no more death. He's going to make it all good. And we need him every day till we get there. And then when we get there, you'll never want to leave him. So I want you to bow your heads, if you will. And we're going to thank God for being this good God. I hope you'll take my challenge to the 28th day of February, get on your knees. Sometimes I got on my knees and said, God, I'm not even sure if I'm doing this right, but here I am again, because I promised to do this every day. And so how many of you are here today? You say, okay, I'm gonna do that. For the next 30 days, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on my knees and pray every day. Don't be heroic. Don't think you have to be a beautiful literary genius, just get on your knees and acknowledge the presence of God and surrender to him. Thank you for those who raised your hand. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is no better thing for you to do. How do you do that? You do it in a prayer. Even right now, you might want to pray this. God, I need a God as good as you are to be my Savior. Jesus, I believe you went to the cross and paid for my sin, and you rose again the third day. And Jesus, I believe in you, and I need you, and I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to save me. Save me today, I pray. Amen.